Jump back into our study on archaeology. We're looking at Israel, um, archaeology with Israel. We're looking at David's palace now. David's palace was discovered in 2009 by Elat Mazar. I don't, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. The granddaughter of Benjamin Mazar, who excavated the southern steps and the western wall. In their last conversation before his death in 1995, they discussed the recovery of David's palace. It took 14 years to find it from the time of his death, and they discussed it. Let's look for David's palace, okay? Silver scrolls. Two silver scrolls were found in an ancient tomb on a hill overlooking the valley of Hinnom. They contained the priestly blessing from Numbers 6, 24 to 26, and date to the 7th century B.C. That is, you know, 2,700 years ago. 2,600, however it works out. These are the oldest portions of Scripture in existence, predating the Dead Sea Scrolls by at least 400 years. That's pretty incredible right there. All right, Baal worship in Israel. Beginning in the book of Numbers, the Bible mentions Israel's relationship with Baal. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam in Judges 2.11. Baal worship was a continual thorn in their side. And really the reason it happened is the same reason that we continue in our sin today. is because we don't extricate it from our lives. We just kind of push it off, but we leave it close enough. And that's the same thing they did. They didn't extricate it from their lives. God said, when you get into the promised land, I'm telling you, I want you to destroy everything and everyone. And that part of that was God's judgment on those nations for rejecting Him. But with His judgment, Him using Israel to judge those nations, and He gave them a very long time to repent, they didn't. But Him using Israel to judge those nations, He was also saying to Israel, He says, you need to separate from this evil or it's going to cause you problems. They will be a thorn in your flesh, which is exactly what you see throughout their history because they didn't obey God. All right, and it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. So the places of Baal, the high places of Baal is what we're looking at there. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Actually, Israel took Baal worship out of Egypt and practiced it at the um, in the wilderness at the foot of Mount Sinai. The calf that they worshipped was known as, and they blink, blank, blanked it out because I'm sure it's something not good, um, in Egypt, but it was the same as Baal worship who was also worshipped in the form of a bull. The bull is symbolic of virility and power, and the people worshipped the bull in pursuit of the satisfaction of the lusts of the flesh as Israel proved when she worshipped the calf at Mount Sinai. So... It's really, it's, this is no different than, than what people do today and how they worship their God, whatever you want to call that. They, they're not going to call it Baal, but it's still Baal worship because it revolves around self, okay, and what they want and satisfying the lusts of the flesh. So Israel proved that they were seeking the lust of the flesh when they worshiped the calf at Mount Sinai. It says, coming off the, the mountain after they get the Ten Commandments, it says, He saw the calf and the dancing, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Look at that, the priest, the appointed leader in Moses' stead, the high priest, the one that should have known better. It says that he made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, among their shame. Now, I can't come to this and not pull over here. All right, because this is something that pervades our society. What, what is being discussed right here. What do you see happening? Okay, there's idolatry. He saw the calf. What's next? Help me. Dancing. Well, what kind of dancing? Keep reading. For Aaron had made them what? What did he make them? Naked. Naked. Why are those always associated? Why is it that that's associated together? And as you read farther on in the Bible and other places, it discusses this instance right here, and it calls it fornication. They were fornicating. 
That's what it was. And this is the same thing you see going on at parties, at clubs, at bars. This right here. This exact thing is what you see going on there. Some of the most despicable things. What's mentioned right here happens. Happened last night. And what's it associated around? You got Christians want to defend all this stuff. It's nonsense to me. You don't love God. You don't love the Bible when you want to try and defend this stuff, period. They say, what's wrong with dancing? There's nothing wrong with dancing. Sure, look at what it leads to. As you study dancing throughout the Bible, when you see like, because they're like, well, David danced before the Lord. Okay, study dancing out in the Bible then. Look at it. Look at what it says about dancing. Whenever you see godly dancing, you never see men and women dancing together. Never. You don't see it in the Bible. The only time you see it is when you see this. Why don't men and women dance together? What did we talk about last week when we finished up on the family? It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Amen. Not to even just touch her. Now what about dancing? Come here. Well, husband and wife shouldn't dance together? No, have at it. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as the music's right. Nothing at all wrong with that. But you don't ever see it out in public. I mean, they're fornicating just on a dance floor is what's happening. That's what it is. And we don't want to recognize that. I mean, I remember going to dances and school dances in middle school. And seeing all that stuff. In middle school. 11, 12, 13 year olds. And it just gets worse in high school. Because now, hey, we can drive and we can leave here and let's go. Prom and homecoming, all that stuff. What happens? Same thing that happened right here. The same exact thing that happened right here. Oh, I wouldn't do that. All right, then just be like the Israelites and, and don't separate from it. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know better. You know better than God. Why are we so full of pride that we won't let God correct us? That we won't let God change our thinking? Why do we persist in our way thinking that we got it right? No, I'll be the exception, God. That won't happen to me. How many statistics do we have? How many st times do we have to be a statistic where God's like, there, I told you, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Why do we insist on having to be a statistic? Why can't we just believe God and be on that end of the statistic? Say, hey amen, hey, God was right, but we want to persist in our rebellion. Why? Because we're seeking the lust of the flesh. That's exactly why, which is what these people did. They worshiped the bull in pursuit of the satisfaction of the lusts of the flesh. They get down there and they want to start doing their idolatry and they're, they're running around naked. The Bible says, you read further through the story, it, it, they knew exactly who to kill. You say, how'd they know who to kill? Because they were still running around naked. Moses gets down and he gets all mad and they still got their clothes off. It's amazing as we've been reading through the Bible and you get to the story of the maniac of Gadara and that guy, he's running around naked in the tombs cutting himself. And then all of a sudden he meets Jesus and he gets saved. And what do you know? The next time you see the maniac of Gadara, he is clothed and in his right mind. He meets Jesus and all of a sudden he puts some clothes on. You know, I've been out there even talking to lost people. Witnessing to lost people, men, women, both. And I've had them, as soon as they realize who I am and what I'm doing, they don't even know I'm a pastor, they just know I'm a Christian. And they start covering up. Men come to the door with no shirt on. And they find out and they're like, oh, excuse me. And they'll, they'll, they'll walk off and come back and they have a shirt on. Or I've had them there hide behind a pole, you know, kind of talking, sorry about, apologize to me. I've had women, as soon as they, they answer the door, you know, wearing some skimpy little shorts or something and, a, uh, you know, like they're in like their pajamas or something and everything's just there. And I just start, you know, I'm like, here, hey, we want to give you an invitation to church. As soon as they find that out, they're like, oh, um, yeah, okay, that'd be great. And they start tugging and pulling things and trying to cover their body up. Why? I didn't ever tell them nothing. There's something about being around holiness, about being around God that'll make people want to put their clothes on. Not the opposite. Not the opposite. Not wanting to take it off. 
See, that's the lust of the flesh. And girls, please, for your own good. And uh, ladies in here, even older ladies, keep yourselves covered. Amen. Cover yourself. That is a treasure for, that God gave you for your husband. For your husband and his eyes only. No one else. Nobody else. It's only for him. And if you're a Christian, then you ought not to put an occasion for stumbling in front of your brother. Amen. And that's what it is. When you don't cover yourself up properly... And we're going to get into that when I start teaching on it. We're going to get into some specifics of what it needs to look like. And I'm going to be as careful as I can be, but I do want to also show us examples of what's wrong. And it won't be super bad, but I, I, I want us to see it so we know this is not right. This is not godly. Because you put a, a, an, an occasion for stumbling in front of your brother. We're going to talk about that stuff, and we're going to show exactly what modesty should look like. And it comes down to it's an issue of your heart. It is an issue of your heart, period. Period. Our outward appearance for any one of us, men, women, does not matter, is an issue of our heart. When you see a man with long hair, he's showing you his heart. His heart says rebellion. That's what it says. It is a shame for a man to have long hair. Doth not even nature itself teach us that. When a man has long hair, it is a shame for him. And it shows his heart and he's rebellious to God. Even if he's lost, that's what it shows. Man, there's so much I feel like I need to teach on. I want to teach on rock music, but I don't have the time to get into that. We've got so much other things. I will. One of these days, I'm going to get to that. I will. But that whole thing, the whole uh, rock as it came out in the, you know, you can take it back to the 20s, and, and we, we, we'll look at the history when we get into it. It's been here forever. We could go back to this right here, and I'll touch on that in just a bit. But it, it's been here forever. But I'm talking about in our modern society here. You get to rock music, and it started really, you could go back to like the 1920s and stuff uh, with the ragtime and all that stuff coming on through into the 50s, and Elvis really pushed that thing forward. And then you get into the 60s, and what all these guys want to do, they want to start growing their hair long. Even in the 60s, they were doing it. They had that surfer cut, which in, in today's standards wasn't really that long. But they were doing it. It was rebellion. It was rebellion. They're showing where their heart is. And many of them just come out and say it. We're, we're anti-God. We're against God. So it works the same for men just as it does women. But it's an issue of your heart. If you want to run around and wear tight clothing... You're showing your heart. Amen. You want to run around and wear low-cut shirts, you're showing your heart. Amen. You want to run around and, and show your thigh, you're showing your heart. Amen. I'm telling you, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. The clothing that's out there today, it's almost all immodest. You're going to have to buy above your size in order to be modest. And we'll get in and define what modest is and what God expects of it. But if I'm not even going to touch on the issue of, of, of cross-dressing right now when I make this statement. I'm not going to touch on that. We'll get to that and we'll show you biblically, okay? But here's what I do want to touch on. All, all these girls wearing these jeans or yoga pants you know, that are skin tight. That can be more alluring to a man than you showing your thigh even because he could see all the curves of your body. And I know sometimes women don't understand it. They don't understand how the male mind works, but I'm just telling you, men, men are visual creatures. Men are visual creatures. That's why the porn industry is a billion dollar industry every year. So if you want to wear that stuff, you're, you're showing your heart. I'm just telling you right now, you're showing your heart. Now especially, after the, just I haven't even really gone into a lot of detail on teaching on, on clothing, but I've said enough from this pulpit 
that you know better, that everyone in this room right now, everyone in this room right now knows better. Every single one of us knows better. We might not know everything we need to know, and that's okay. But I guarantee in here, and this goes for the men too, stinking running around wearing skinny jeans, that's so stinking effeminate. That is so effeminate. And don't let your boys wear skinny jeans. Amen. I'm almost like, like I doubt, I don't think I would be any, anything different. That I wouldn't even let one of my daughters date a boy that wears skinny jeans. Amen. He, what? <laughs> Why? Because it's effeminate. The Bible still says that's a sin, by the way. Amen. I wouldn't let her date a guy with long hair. Amen. Why? It's effeminate. So why would I let her date someone that wears skinny jeans? It's effeminate. Amen. Well, it's not your decision. You sure about that? You better go study the Bible. You better study the Bible on that. I'm her head. I mean, honestly, this is how we, have to, we, how we need to lead our families. And it's not that we're some mean dictator. It's that we're protecting our children. Amen. We're protecting our children. We have to guard them. We have to guide them. We have to help them. Hey, we've had fun times in the morning sometimes before my kids are going off to school when they were um, in Christian school. We had fun times. I'm being sarcastic with that. It was not fun times. I'm like, hey, you need to change. And then the leaking starts. <sighs> You know, like a leaky tire just coming on out, you know, but we have to do that. I've had to tell my wife to change before. Amen. Amen. And you think, well, oh, you've always been like this. No, no, not at all. I didn't grow up in this at all. I grew up on the other end, looking at what I wanted to look at. with every other guy doing the same thing. I know what's in men. Amen. I know that the locker room talk is, is real. Not my boyfriend. <laughs> sure, you keep telling yourself that. Keep telling yourself that. Unless he has a, a pure mind and he's seeking to follow the Lord, even he has to fight that. Amen. Even he has to fight that. I've seen the other end of it, and I know, and every man in here knows too, knows what men look at, knows what men like. Ladies, you've got to guard yourself, every one of you in here, every one of you in here. So they made themselves naked unto their shame. It was shame. It was shame for them to be naked. I believe it's in, it's either Jeremiah or Isaiah, it says that they, they wouldn't blush at their sin anymore. Right. What does that mean? Can you look that up for me, brother? I believe it's Jeremiah, if I'm not mistaken, but they wouldn't, and we'll look at this when, we, when I teach on clothing, but they, they wouldn't blush anymore at their sin at what they were doing. It, it means they had no shame anymore. All right, let's go there. Jeremiah 6.15. Thank you, brother. Okay. All right, let's pick up Jeremiah 6 and verse, we'll just read, was it verse 15 there? 
All right, verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. See, they couldn't blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. What did it say? They couldn't blush. They had no shame. They didn't feel ashamed at their sin. You know, anyone ever been embarrassed and their face gets red? It's because you're ashamed. You're ashamed, so you blush. You're like, oh, man, your face gets all flushed and red. and You know, it just, it's, it's just not a good feeling. No one likes it. See, that's how it is when we first step into sin. We'll feel that. Oh. But as you keep going, you keep going. That starts to go away. And you no longer feel shame. You no longer blush. What do you say? Just like they did in verse 16, we will not walk therein. I'm not going to do what you said, God. At first, it'd be, the attitude would be like, oh, you know, I shouldn't do that, but I'll just this once. And then by the end, you say, I'm not walking in that. I don't care. That's what happens. So I look at some of these girls and the way they dress, and I'm like, man, do they have a dad? Do they have a dad? Does that fool not know how men look at women, at young girls even? Does he not know that he's going to let his daughter walk out of the house looking like that, knowing that she's eye candy for all these men walking down the street? Lest we forget, we're not in a world of godly men. Amen. We're not. It's our job to protect them, to guard them, even if it means, hey, we're going to have a battle the battle's on. Amen. We got to help them. We got to teach them. And yes, there is the aspect of the man. He needs to guard his eyes. But we have to understand that, you know, most of what's out there is not Christian men that are seeking to please the Lord. They're lost men that are seeking to please the flesh, that are seeking to do this. He saw the calf and the dancing for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. That's what they came off of the mountain and saw and they witnessed this big, huge group fornication going on. That's what was happening. They're all there dancing. And as they're coming down, Joshua says, hey, I hear the noise of war in the camp. It sounds like there's a battle going on right there. And Moses says, no, 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 that's no battle. That's the sound of music that I do here. What kind of music sounds like war? You ever heard heavy metal? You ever heard heavy metal? That just sounds like screaming garbage. Right here. That's what was going on. They had a club going on in the wilderness. Club wilderness. That's what was happening right there. And you got some so-called Christian churches here in Albuquerque, Club 180, a Christian club. Of darkness, they make it just like a, world, the world, a worldly club. It's a place for Christians to get together and fornicate. I guarantee it. I guarantee it because you're not going to be able to be uh, uh, around and be all, all over each other like that and it's not going to happen. That's exactly what happened right here, but we don't want to learn from that. We want to think it's okay. Well, I just won't partake of that. I won't do that. I can go to prom. I can do this. I can, I can go to this wedding over here for my family that they're having, and I just won't uh, participate in any of that. Man, just, hey, go show your respects. Hey, here's our motto. We come, we eat, we leave, all right? Amen. Just go eat and leave and tell everyone hi. And I'm telling you, when music starts, we're out. We leave. And I tell my family ahead of time, like, you guys know we're, this is what we're doing. And they just know they're still our family. We still want to, you know, rejoice in the, the wedding or whatever it may be with them for that. But once this nonsense starts, we're out of there. We're out of there. And they might get mad, and I'm sure they have, and, but they haven't said anything really. I mean, oh, you guys are leaving? Yeah, we're out of here. But they understand. They just hold your ground. Don't be ashamed to stand for the Lord. Why are we ashamed to stand for God? When we're ashamed to stand for God, we'll end up right there. 
We'll end up right there. You know, stand up to your coworkers about this stuff. They say, why don't you do that? Because it's wicked. Just tell them. Because it's wicked. I mean, why are we ashamed that we believe the Bible? Why are we ashamed that we love the Lord? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But we fear our friends. We fear our co-workers. Just tell them, no, I don't do that. We don't do that. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Not what my preacher says. It's not my parents won't let me. Better check your heart then. Amen. Better check your heart if that's what you're saying. Do you love the Lord? Baal was also worshipped as the storm god who could bring good harvest and defeat one's enemies. Baal worship is about the pursuit of good fortune, success, blessing, Idolatry is not about worshiping God. It's about getting something for myself and avoiding trouble. That is idolatry right there. Because you make up a God of your own image that does what you want. Psalm 10.4 says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. The wicked says, I don't want to know what God says about that. Don't tell me. Ignorance is bliss. I'm happy not knowing. Don't tell me. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Dangerous times are going to come is what it's saying. For men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. And what do they have? A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They're religious. They're religious. Got all these people say, I'm religious, I'm spiritual. I'm sure you are as you follow the devil to hell. I'm sure you are. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, not according to the Word of God. You're wrong. You're wrong according to the Word of God. But look, they go back to this one right here. Through the, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. They don't care what God says. What God says doesn't matter to me. Oh, I, 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 hey, I, I know Jesus is my Savior. You, I'm sure you do. Just not the Jesus of the Bible. You've got another Christ. Another Jesus. The Bible warned about that. They invented a God according to their own dictates. That's what I did. Before I got saved, I had, hey, Jesus was my Savior too. Oh, Jesus died for me. It was just another Jesus. It was one I made up in my head, an imaginary God. See, they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. What's the power there? The Word of God, the blood of Christ, His atonement for our sin. They're denying that. I don't really need that. I'll just make up my own God that's going to please me and suit me. Evidence of Baal worship has been found in Israel. At Megiddo, a large round Baal altar was excavated, plus images of Baal standing in his storm god stance, as well as seated on a throne. So this is all found, archaeology has found all this in Israel, that this is what the Israelites did. All right, we'll stop right there.